The National Broadcasting Company invites you by transcription to join the chase. In the animal world, there is the hunter and the hunted. Hound and fox, hawk and sparrow, cat and mouse. We in the topmost species have also joined the hunt. But who is to judge precisely which of us are hounds or foxes as we enter the chase? I've been a party member all my life. From the time I was three and was taken to the square to have my first glimpse of the Kremlin, I have been lectured, trained, indoctrinated with the gospel. The true faith, as our leaders like to think of it. When they were done with me, they were sure they had a finished product, an automaton who would click his heels and do their bidding, think their thoughts, believe in their fantastic theories. And then I was awarded the highest honor, the ultimate proof of their confidence in me. I was trained as an agent of the secret police. The mold was cast, and to them it was a firm one. They taught me their methods, showed me their tricks, and then dispatched me to weed out the dissidents, spy on those who dared think for themselves, liquidate the undesirables. How were they to know that one day I, too, would become one of the undesirables? It was Professor Kolchak who first noticed the change in me. Professor Kolchak, the beloved schoolteacher, one of the few men who still believed in freedom of mind and soul. If I had said what I said to anyone else in my Budapest apartment that rainy summer evening, this diary would have been blotted out at its inception. This diary which I write in English, hoping that someday, somehow, it will fall into British or American hands. It is nice here in your flat, Andrei. So quiet and peaceful. Ah, you are welcome to stay as long as you like, Professor. Uh, I have only come for a short visit. Andrei, I have been troubled about you. About me? But why? Something is happening to you. Something I, I, I cannot fathom. Perhaps I'm getting tired of being an executioner. Perhaps I am sick of being a bloodhound. A ferret who has the power of life and death over malcontents. Ah, we are living in difficult times, Andre. And in a difficult country. Andre. They taught me all their tricks. Their incredibly clever tricks. I've been given the degree of master of espionage and self-preservation when in the camp of the enemy. And I am getting tired of it. Quiet, my boy, quiet. Men have said less for a bullet behind the neck. <sighs> Professor, as you know, I have been sent into the western camp many times. Yes. As an agent. I have seen how they live in the West. I have read their books and newspapers and spoken with the people. And you have become disillusioned with the party? Mm, let us say that I have begun to ask myself questions. Questions for which I find no answers. And when you find the answers, what will you do? Desert for the West? No. No, of course not. I've been indoctrinated too well and for too long. The West would never trust me for one thing. <laughs> but what am I saying? I have no intention of leaving, Professor. The jackals never join the lions. When one is a jackal, one remains a jackal. Then this is merely idle talk? Oh, no more. You disappoint me, Andre. Do I? For a moment I thought, well, <laughs> no matter. I still think of you almost as my son, in spite of how differently we have always felt about the regime. Yeah. Your talk is dangerous, too, my old friend. <laughs> Will you turn me in for treacherous leaning? <laughs> turn you in? I would sooner leap from the window and end it. As so many have done before me. Not you, Andre. Oh, don't worry. I am much too much of a realist. Besides, I am not an easy mark, remember. 
If at any time I choose to leave, I leave. But they will follow. Ah, uh, you forget, old friend, that I am one of them, schooled in all their subtler methods. Professor, if I should leave, when they should try to liquidate me, they would have to catch me first. And the cat would not be chasing the mouse in my case, Professor. <laughs> uh, I, too, am a cat. Uh, you are expecting a call? No. It's on my private wire. Excuse me. Yes? Andrei Provish. Speaking. Comrade Potkin here. Good evening, comrade. Are you alone? Uh, yes. Busy? No. Good. Come and see me at once. Tonight, comrade? I will wait for you in my office. Uh, but I... That is an order, comrade. Very well. Twenty minutes. Yeah. I'll be there. Who was it, Andre? Ah, uh, Potkin. Hmm. What does he want? He wishes to see me. It must be urgent. Have you spoken to anyone? The way you just spoke to me, Andre? No, Professor. No. But something is up, and I don't like the looks of it. Uh, will you remain here? No, I will return to my own apartment. And then I'll see you there. Andre, my boy... Be careful. There is no need to warn me, old friend. I have been a dues-paying member of the firm for many years. I will be very careful, I assure you. They will never get Andre Provish to follow the others through the window. Potkin was my immediate superior. A man with the mind of a hyena, the appetite of a horse, and the face of a pig. His office was a gigantic room furnished in the most lavish bourgeois manner. It always reminded me of something I read once in the West. They wrote that we in the party are all equal. Only some are more equal than others. Comrade Potkin. Comrade Provis, come in, please. Cigarette? No, thank you. No? American cigarettes, comrade? Well, naturally. Unfortunately, the best tobacco is produced by the bourgeois democracies along with the tastiest food and the most attractive women. I get very tired of our athletic females, comrade, with their powerful muscles and inflexible minds. A bit of fluff would be welcome from time to time. Mm, that sounds <laughs> suspiciously like dissatisfaction, comrade. Don't be ridiculous. I was merely being facetious. Of course. Now, uh, why have you called me here, comrade Potkin? I have a new assignment for you, Andre. Oh, in the West? By your tone, one would think you enjoy working in the democracies. A true party member should find it a nauseating sacrifice. I do, I assure you. Then you should appreciate this assignment, comrade. It can be handled right here in Budapest. What is it? A simple matter of getting rid of a dissident intellectual. Who? Oh. Professor Kolchek. Professor Kolchek? You know him? Oh, well, yes, everyone has heard of the professor. Everyone has heard too much of the professor, Provis. That is why we want him out of the way. He was always a middle-class intellectual, a soft-shelled pedagogue with dangerous ideas. Up to now, we have tolerated him, for he has sentimental friends. He has those friends no longer, however. And he must go. But... But what, comrade? I, uh, I was just thinking of his age. What has his age got to do with it? He is an enemy of the state, is he not? He is a proponent of dangerous anti-revolutionary ideas. Because he believes in freedom of expression? What did you say? I... I said because he believes in freedom of expression, naturally this is most dangerous. Andre, as an old friend and comrade, I must warn you. Your behavior of late has been less than exemplary. Has it? There is talk about you. Small talk, it is true, but disturbing talk, nevertheless. You, you forget, have... Comrade Potkin, that I have friends in Moscow, and that I learned party discipline while you were swabbing streets in Kiev. Be careful who you accuse and how you accuse. <laughs> One of my assignments may be marked with your name. You dare talk to your superior like that? There are no superiors in the cause, Comrade, or have you forgotten? You have your assignment, Provish. I have. Carry it out. Bring me proof of Kolchik's death within 24 hours. You understand? I'll bring you his head, comrade, on a silver platter for lunch tomorrow. So it had come to that. They wanted me to rid them of Kolchik. 
Kolchak, my most trusted friend. And for what? What had he done? I was sure now that the time had come. I had to break and break fast or I would be next. This situation was intolerable and I was getting out. But first, I had to warn Professor Kolchik. Those were my orders, Professor. You must leave the country at once. And you? I will go with you. But, but where? How can we escape? They, they are too smart for us, Andre. We are, we are doomed. <laughs> smart, yes. But I, too, am smart. And in their own way, Professor. I know every move they will make before they make it. I've played the hound too long myself. I will match them trick for trick, maneuver for maneuver. We'll see what happens when spy hunts for spy. Shall we head for Berlin and try to get across the American side? No, no, that would be suicide, Professor. It is just what they would look for. Every train, every plane, every road between here and Berlin will be covered. No, that is the pattern they expect us to take. But we will do the unexpected. The unexpected? Yes. We will cross the Iron Curtain from the east. The east? Through Russia itself. They will never dream of us taking a course like that. From Russia, we will go south through Stalingrad and onto Turkey. If that is not feasible, we'll travel through Siberia and China to Hong Kong. I will forge the necessary documents. I've done it many times. Uh, Professor, how much money do you have? Mm, not too much, Andre. Uh, I have some British pounds and American dollars. We can get a premium for them on the black market, but we need more. Ah, perhaps Sonia will have some. Sonia Pavlovich? Your sweetheart? Yes, I will see her immediately. And tell her everything? Uh, Professor, she loves me. Even the Kremlin magicians have found no way to transform love into deception. No, pack your things and meet me at the railway station, Professor. In exactly one hour, we'll leave Budapest. They've given me a day to get rid of you. That means a 24-hour lead, old friend, before they begin the chase. And remember, from now on, our lives depend on every move we make. Sonia could be trusted. I was sure of it. No matter how she felt about my escape, there was still a debt of gratitude and sentiment which she owed me, and which I now hope to collect. Andre, Andre, my darling, I am so glad you've come tonight. I have missed you so, my darling. Uh, Sonia. Life is so difficult. Really, Andre, it appalls me. I have read something today in the papers which has depressed me. What are we coming to? What is happening to people, Andre? Sonia, there is something I want to tell you. Later, Andre. Later. First, you must kiss me. Oh, Andre. My Andre. Sonia, what is it that's disturbed you so? What have you read today? You know about Droshkin? The Central Committee member? He was executed last night. For what? Dissemination of false democratic propaganda. Isn't that horrible, my Andre? You mean horrible that he was killed? Of course not. Horrible that he should have spread lies about our leader. That was too good for him. If I held my way... But, Sonia, he only uttered an opinion in regard to the war in Asia. He merely suggested that, well, perhaps we had made a few mistakes about the democracy. Mistakes? We never make mistakes. If I were in Moscow, I would go to his execution myself. Happily. Suppose... Suppose it was I who had disagreed with the party line, Sonia. How would you feel then? I would attend your execution too, Andre. <laughs> oh, you are getting morbid. Let us forget about Droshkin. Only the worms are interested in him now. Yes, of course. What was it you wanted to tell me before? You seem to have something on your mind. It was nothing, Sonia. Nothing at all. Forget it. Sonia, too. They had polluted her mind completely. They had changed her from a woman to a robot. A walking echo as far as the leaders were concerned. I could see that I would get no help from that direction. Five minutes later, I made some excuse and left her house, promising to return in the morning. I went home by a roundabout route, then entered my apartment through the rear. It was very lucky I had taken that precaution, for as I crossed the kitchen, I heard a voice in my sitting room, a familiar voice, talking to someone on the telephone. This is Comrade Potkin. Yes, I'm in his apartment. He should return very shortly. I will take care of it. Yes, naturally, he must not be allowed to leave. 
He will be found in the morning, comrade, another accidental victim who has fallen through the window. If you like, you can start to prepare the obituary now. It could only have been Sonia who informed them. Somehow she must have suspected me. I turned quickly and left the apartment without a sound, then hurried over to Professor Kolchak. It was now or never for both of us. He was there? In your apartment, Andre? Yes. Then we are lost. No, not yet, Professor. But what can we do? How can we leave the city? At least before we had 24 hours. Pack some things in a small bundle, an extra pair of woolen hose and some linen. We must leave here at once. For where? The airport. But that is the first place they will cover. Ah, we are not going to the commercial airport, Professor. We are going to the military transport field just south of the city. The military Don't argue, Professor. We have no time. Hurry, please. We drove to the airport by way of the side road, and I abandoned my car. Then we waited in the shrubbery as three heavy transports took off and turned east. What I was looking for was a small plane that carried no more than a crew of two. And our luck held out as I spotted one fueling up on the southwest runway. The pilot was a woman. She was standing beside the plane, signing her cargo receipt as I walked over to her with the professor a few feet behind me. Good evening, comrade. Good evening. Where is this cargo going? And who wants to know? Andre Provis, secret police. My identification, comrade. Oh, I am sorry. My cargo goes to Bucharest, comrade. You know what it contains? No. Good. You make room inside for my assistant and myself. You are coming with me? Yes. May I see your order? My identification will suffice, comrade. Part of this cargo is extremely valuable. Headquarters has assigned me to escort it to its destination. What am I carrying? Hmm. It would be better for you to remain ignorant of its contents. Now, how many in your crew? Just my co-pilot. He is in the cabin now. Have him remain there. Uh, comrade Kolchak and I will ride in the cockpit with you. Kolchak! Yes, Andre. We are ready to lift. Step inside. Uh, your name is uh, Provish, comrade? Uh, yes. Mine is Brom. Bertha Brom. Uh, German, hmm? I was until I saw the light. Now I'm a citizen of the great, all-powerful... Yes, host. yes, yes, of course. But we have no time for speeches now, Fräulein Brom. Are you ready to take off? As soon as you enter the plane... After you, Fräulein. My card impressed her, and I could see she was intimidated by any mention of the secret police. But how long she would continue to be fooled was exactly as long as we could look forward to our chance for freedom. You, uh, you handle the controls like an expert, Fräulein Brand. I have been a pilot for 10 years, comrade. In Germany? Yeah. Hitler's Germany. What difference does that make? I, too, am a flyer, Fräulein. Yes. That was part of my training. Uh, perhaps I can relieve you and take over the controls when you are tired. I am sorry, but that is strictly forbidden, even for an agent. Yes, naturally. What, uh, what course are you taking? South, South East. Oh, of course, to Bucharest. Uh-huh. Uh, how soon shall we arrive? Oh, two hours, perhaps. Good. Then we can relax. The cold said, do you have a cigarette? Yes. Thank yeah. you. Well, and your co-pilot must be lonesome back there with the cargo. No, he is used to it. Oh. Is he armed? Why do you ask? The shipment is too important to take chances with. If your co-pilot was an enemy agent... Time? Oh, don't be ridiculous. He is a numbskull who obeys orders without question. A perfect recruit for the Central Committee, hmm? What's that? Sarcasm, comrade? It is a message from Budapest. Would you hand me those earphones on the back of your seat? Here you are. Something is wrong, Fräulein? The reception is not good. Wait, I have them now. I watched her face as she listened and saw her expression change from puzzlement to startled surprise. Then she looked at me, and I knew what the message was without a doubt. You'll excuse me, comrade, while I pull this wire. No! Take your hands off me! I'll also accept that revolver next to your seat. There we are. Now, behave yourself, Fräulein, and follow my orders. You have tricked me! 
They want you in Budapest. They don't always get what they want, Fräulein. I will go back to the cabin and make certain the co-pilot is taken care of, Andre. No, Professor. I'll handle it. Change your course, Fräulein. No! Fräulein, let me warn you. I may be an outcast now, but at one time I was in the secret police. I have murdered for the state many times, and it will be a small matter to murder now for my own safety. Change your course, woman. In which direction? West. West, Andre. Yes. I had not counted on the lock of capturing a plane intact, Project. It will not be necessary to escape the hard way now. In one hour, we can be in the American zone in Austria. Free men. Well, Fräulein? I have changed course. As you directed. Kojic. Yes, Andre. Lock the door behind me. The co-pilot can stay with the cargo until we land. <laughs> there is nothing he can do back there. All right, Andre. You will never get away with it, you... Horror from within is always a good phrase, Fräulein. Or, uh, oh yes, deviation is perhaps. If you run out of epithets, you can always borrow from the manual approved by the Central Committee and the little father. Andre! Oh, it's a fighter plane, a MiG. They're shooting at us. You see? You are caught. You will die now if you do so. Does it occur to you that you will join us, Fräulein? No, no, they mustn't. There's a parachute underneath your seat, Coach. Strap it on. Yes, I'm and you, Fräulein, will take off your own parachute and give it to me. But what will I use? Wings, if you can throw them soon enough. You are Expose a woman to certain death. In the super state, comrade, there is no gallantry or happen to her. Off with the children. Kotek, the port motor has been hit. It's in flames. Jump, jump, Kotek. Open the door. Please excuse our hasty departure, Fräulein, and thank you for the ride. plunged out of the cockpit and pulled the cord. For an awful second, nothing happened. And then suddenly the chute burst open and I was floating down in pitch darkness with the noise of the plane above me receding in the night. I landed in an empty field, removed my chute and buried it in the ground. I had no idea where Kolchak was and it would have been impossible to find him in any case in the dead of night. So I trudged across the field to a road that ribboned away on my right. A heavy truck was parked on one side, and I saw the driver's legs protruding from underneath the chassis. He was evidently making some repairs, so as quietly as I could, I climbed into the rear and settled down behind some potato sacks. A few minutes later, I heard the motor cough and we started to move. This was the last thing I remember before I fell asleep, exhausted. I have no idea how long I slept, but when I awoke, it was daylight. I peered out through the canvas covers and saw that we were inside a large city. A moment later, I knew it was Vienna, but I was still in the eastern zone, and I realized it would take all the artfulness at my command to cross over to the west. It was exactly five days later, just before I was ready to make my final move, that a miracle happened. I was sitting in an outdoor cafe, a beer in my hand, when I heard a familiar voice just behind me. Andre! Kolchek! Oh, Kolchek, old friend! Oh, imagine I thought I would never see you again. Sit down and uh, keep your voice low. There are always agents about. Hmm. Now, how did you get here? Sheer luck. And you? Yeah, more of the same. Where are you staying? Hotel Münchner. I am using the name of Prakov. And you? I am in a rooming house on Feldstrasse. Yeah. I uh, have forged papers, and I am crossing the line tonight. Perhaps I can get some for you as well. No, no, you have done enough for me, my friend. No, no, not quite. Freedom is not far from here. But in order to reach it, there is still a ways to go. Now, do as I say, Kolchik. Meet me at my hotel this evening at 7. Meanwhile, I shall get hold of your papers. You mean, you really think you can get us across the line to the west? <laughs> I am still a cat, Kolchik. And only eight of my lives have been lost so far. I am one man they cannot force to use the window. No, but now we must separate. It is too dangerous here. Remember, 7 o'clock at the Hotel Münchner. I'll be waiting for you. I spent the rest of the day getting papers for Kolchak and arrived at my hotel a little before our rendezvous time. As I approached the door to my room, I suddenly had a premonition of trouble. I tried the room next to mine and it was empty. I entered and crossed to the door which connected with my own room. Cautiously, I opened it and peered through the crack. 
Comrade Potkin was standing near the window with his back to me, one hand on a revolver in his pocket, waiting. Don't move, Potkin. Move it. Keep your hands up. All right, just hold still. Now, I'll relieve you of your gun, comrade, if you don't mind. You are a very clever man, Andre. Thank you for the compliment. But it will do you no good. No? You're finished now. You cannot escape. <laughs> a familiar refrain, Potkin. But let me remind you that up to now I have done quite well. You fool. Do you think I am alone? There are others who will hunt you down. Yes, yes, I know many others. But they can be eliminated, Potkin, as you will be now. You... You would shoot me in cold blood? Why not? Wasn't I taught to execute with finesse? But... But that is... That is inhuman, Provis. You talk about inhumanity? How much blood have you spilled, Potkin? How many have pleaded with you for their lives to your amusement? Look, look, uh, release me and I will pay you well. I have money, much money. I have gold in Switzerland. As a precaution, comrade, if the regime should collapse. Uh, take it all, Andre, but don't kill me. Don't kill me. I am nearing the end of this diary now. Potkin is lying on the floor beside this desk, looking for all the world like a dead fish out of water. My papers are in order, and I am ready to make the final dash across the line. All I'm waiting for is Kolchak, my old friend who... Ah, he's here. He's coming in the door. But... But... He has a gun in his hand. A gun, and he's pointing it at me. Professor! Remain where you are, Andre. You... You... are one of them, too. You are clever about everything, Andre. But me. Oh, now I see it. Now I see it clearly. I wondered why all my moves were checkmated. You were informing them about me all along. Potkin in my apartment in Budapest. The fighter plane. Potkin here. That's all you're doing, Kolchak. You were being tested, Andre, at first, when they assigned you to wipe me out. If you had made the attempt, I was prepared to stop you and testify to your loyalty. Loyalty? What do you know about loyalty? You and all the rest of the filth you call your comrades. You would knife your own brothers and twist their handles in the wounds if they gave the order. You have little time to waste in preachments, Andre. For years you believed as they did while pretending to be the last of the free-thinking intellectuals, the secret lovers of democracy, the men who would fight for freedom with the last drop of blood. But underneath it all, you were one of the inner circle with the morals of a snake. You have your choice, Andre. The window... Or a bullet in the head. <laughs> you always boasted that you would never end by way of the window. Well, which do you prefer right now? The... The window will be good enough, Kolchak. Then move. With pleasure. No, but not by myself, Kolchak. I'll take the window, yes, but we'll go together, comrade. <laughs> In the animal world, there is the hunter and the hunted. Hound and fox, hawk and sparrow, cat and mouse. We in the topmost species have also joined the hunt. But who is to judge precisely which of us are hounds or foxes as we enter the chase? Chase was created and written for the National Broadcasting Company by Lawrence Clee. In tonight's cast, Norman Rose was heard as Andre. Others in the cast were June Foray, Edgar Staley, and Stefan Schnabel. The Chase was engineered by Lee Kramer, your announcer Fred Collins. The Chase was directed and transcribed by Walter McGraw. Next week, a toupee transforms a ball-headed man into a fugitive from death in The Chase. Starting the 18th, enjoy the best of Groucho on NBC.